Oi! I'm Cyber. We played D&D &D again today, and uh, we finished off our Frozen Sick adventure. So now we'll be transitioning a little bit into more of the stuff that's a little bit more loosely, goosely converted from Rhyme of the Frostmaiden. Well, let's talk about that. So last time we left off, our party had just started talking to Feral Sol, the Aeorian alchemist who is now all white still toiling on his uh, disease that can even infect and eventually kill the gods themselves. Yeah, a dude's got issues. Issues that may seem justified for, you know, someone who watched their entire civilization get destroyed by vengeful deities. So bioweapons. So the party, the party had just started talking to him. I, I did have him sort of like lead the party into a conversation with him. Like he was asking like, were you sent to help me or no, I think you, you have to be sent here by the gods to steal my work or destroy me or something like that. With a lot of archaic English being thrown in there. Um, uh, which was honestly very fun to look up. Uh, the The party started off by like pleading to him, like, "Hey, no, your this this sickness, this frigid woe, uh, is infecting like innocent people, and we we just want to make sure that they're cured." Party didn't roll quite high enough on uh on the persuasion check to make him fully trust them, so he had pondered a little bit and decided that the risk of having the cure fall into the hands of the gods was something that he could not deal with, and so he could not help the party. As long as the gods remain on Exandria, he cannot let the cure out of his laboratory. But wait a minute. There's this player. Realize that, hey, this guy is talking about events that seem very familiar to a very important lore video that just got posted on Critical Role's site, and I think he's talking about events that happened before the Calamity. So wait, it's, this is 827 years too late. Player's actual words. One year off. Just one. So the party started explaining like, hey, things progress at the end of the <laughs> Calamity, and, and uh, the, the gods actually banish themselves from the world and cannot interfere anymore. Which sort of depressed him, <laughs> or uh, it, it sent him into um, a state of contemplation because his life and unlife's work, getting revenge on the gods, is now next to impossible to achieve. But with the party coming, coming around again and doing more persuasion checks, now that he's a little bit more receptive, he did agree to hand over the key to the cures for the first woe. So long as they promise to not let it fall into the hands of the gods, which pretty near impossible is going to happen. The party made their way to the curative laboratory. This is a this is a room that is largely empty and also flooded. The and the chest containing the cures was hidden underwater. Uh, the party quickly found that, or the party could quickly figure out that hey, the chest is underwater with a with a very decent perception check. Unfortunately, that perception check was not high enough to prevent them from, or unfortunately, that check was not high enough to prevent the party from alerting a giant enemy crab. So here's this giant enemy crab. So after a very short combat in which the party had to deal with four giant crabs, they were able to recover the vials of Frigid Woe Cure, or Frigid Woe Antidote, and... Also, an Urtzat's eye, a, a, a Aeorian prosthesis to replace a damaged eye. And quickly made their way back out of the laboratory with the cure in tow. I think it's really interesting that in order to complete the in order to complete the quest, the Party really only needs to go through one, two, three, four, five, six rooms. Honestly, only, only five, but, you know, they should probably encounter Feral Saul 
before any of this is done. There is more like lore and stuff that you can get on the other side. I know Feral Saul has a like notebook that he wrote during the crash, like while Saul Saul was plummeting towards Isocross, where he saved, well, this is saved. He preserved everybody, or with the use of necromancy. He's the one who made all the zombies and everything within Saul's vault. They used to be Aeorians, and is responsible for his own now white condition, specifically so that their work could, could continue. They can continue working on this disease. But most of it is largely secondary to, uh, to what the party needs to do to complete the quest, which is fine. I think it's like a standard thing in uh, introductory modules that like, hey, there's, there's actually a very short route to the emboss. The players can d d just explore elsewhere if they, if they really want to. I know that that was something in like the starter kit adventure, Lost Minds of Vandelver. But with the party having their quarry in tow, they decided to, uh, fuck it. We got what we need. We're, we're gonna write. This is not a place of honor. Nothing sacred is hidden here. Warnings on the door to keep people from also catching the disease. And uh, it just decided to go on back. I did pre-roll a few encounters, which I had mentioned in previous campaign diaries. So it was, it was really fun to see how the players reacted to those. The first one of those was something that I think everybody should throw at a second level party at one point. An ancient white dragon. So if we look in the random encounters in Icewind Dale, Rhyme with the Frost Maiden, one of those is just a nice little non-combat encounter with Arviatris, the ancient white dragon, and her Netherese rider, Meltharond, uh, since the party had just come from an Aeorian ruin. I think it would have been really cool for the party to see, or if the characters would have recognized that, like, hey, what Meltharond is wearing, very similar to the, uh, to the clothes that, like, Feral Saul and everybody else was just wearing. Unfortunately, high perception checks for some of the party to be able to make out the details of the dragon. Not so high on the perception, on the history checks for those players that did. But yeah, this, uh, this gargantuan ancient white dragon popped out of the water with a walrus in her mouth and decided to start munching. Noticed the party. Spoke to the rider. You know, didn't, didn't say much else. And, uh, yeah, and just let the party go on their merry way. There are a few details that I bring up in like the first campaign diary. Um, that would be some spoilers for, for my players. Uh, nothing that's on the page right now. But, um, uh, I think that would be really cool to circle back to. The party did notice that there was, like, shrapnel around the dragon's eyes, which is a change from Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. But after that, they just, they just kept being able to make their way to Serenia. On the day before they were going to be able to get back to Serenia, the party encountered a abandoned campsite in the middle of which sat a bag of holding. Uh, this, was, this was another encounter that I sort of saw as a turning point between just what Frozen Sick was, which was a, a quest of simple heroics and tomb raiding, to the more horror aspects that are going to come out of Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. The party approached this campsite. The fire was still burning and everything. There was no sign of the owner leaving or doing anything. There was just a bag of holding on the ground. The players uh, looked around for the owner, looked around for tracks, didn't find anything but did notice a sign of a struggle very close to the bag. One of my players did pick up on the sort of inspiration for this, which was a monster, well, not really a monster in Venerick and Sky to, to Ravenloft, but a, a sort of example of a horror monster, the Bagman. 
a, a monster that emerges from bags of holding and snatches people and drags them in to never be seen again. I don't know if that's going to actually be a thing. I, I more just wanted there to be a mystery that is not going to have an answer. That the party can only really get away from if they leave behind their bag of holding. Uh, and I, I do think I want like somebody around camp, if, if anybody does talk about like the thing that they found, to like bring up the story of the bagmen. But more so, I, d I just wanted to make a spoopy, non-combat, non-anything encounter. Just some environmental storytelling. <laughs> and, you know what? I think I accomplished that. Also, right before we had done this, my party had just run through uh, Descent to Avernus. And there is a bag of devouring that you can find in Descent to Avernus, which one of my party members did find. And which one of my party members should have died to. So giving them another bag of holding to torment them with. Very fun. The party got back to Serenia. They were able to get the buyer to send the frigid woe antidotes back to Palebank Village. So uh, along with the note to say like, hey, these Hiamak hold is one of them is sick too. Cure her too. We promised. I may have uh, thoughts on how that's going to, to affect things because I don't know that the TMAC cultists like really think, thought that uh, they would be true to their word. Uh, I'm sure I will have more thoughts later this week whenever Fizzbench Treasury of Dragons finally comes out. Oh, which, hey, everybody leveled up to level three right before that book came, came out. So, hey, my mo the monk character, uh, Toph, does not have to do any weird shit. They will be able to take up take up their subclass. They they also left behind the rest of the Frigid Woe antidotes. At originally they wanted to sell them, which the buyer was like, "Hey, I'll give you a kickback whenever some somebody buys them from me." But if you want me to pay you up front, give me some incentive because you haven't been around that long. We don't have a lot of rapport, which was sort of my way of saying, hey, you should probably, you maybe want to ask around and maybe do a few quests around Serenia um, before people will just be like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make some good deals and stuff. But instead, as a sign of goodwill, the party was just like, hey, no, uh, you do that free of charge, but make sure whoever uh, whoever is coming down with Frigid Woe, if they come here asking for it, give them the cure free of charge. So, they, they got to resolve all that. A few other things did happen. Darius uh, did go retrieve his map and does now have a location uh, that he would be able to seek out for his inheritance. Unfortunately, it is very far away. Hopefully all, all of that will be uh, a decent enough thread to follow in the future. And we did have a bit of time for the party to decide on what they want to do next. Uh, they went back to their yurt where they did have their uh, two mage friends, Forvin, the acolyte of the Luxon from the Kreen Dynasty, who Darius actually did uh, talk to and realized that, oh... This guy was captured coming off of a merchant ship belonging to my sister. I'm sure no no bad things would would come about that and this uh this very spiteful sister who thinks that Dares murdered his brother is uh not going to come back into the into play anytime soon. And then the other mage uh Jacob Diedrich is definitely okay with uh, helping the party get to Balin Post, where Toph has an assignment from the Cobalt Soul. So the party, as of right now, the party is deciding to make their way across Isocross to Balin Post, and after that to Alawak Sanctuary, where T has uh, supplies that that the Yetis sent them out to go get. 
which was why they were in Pale Bank at the very beginning. I did talk to the players a, a little bit more about putting mechanics around the uh, magical tarcro the from the cartographer around the Guild of Beacons. I didn't know how far I wanted to go with that, but I did have some ideas that pretty much resulted in this magic item, the Guild of Beacons map. Squishing some of the mechanics from the cartographer ranger by Hannah Rose and Devon Rue, and the Acquisitions Incorporated cartographer job decided hey here here's a, here's a small little system that the guild of beacons can help you do there will be cartographers at all the major settlements if you give them some gold they can accurately chart down locations that the party has visited and so long as the party has been to a location and has it marked on the map they can do the safe tra the tale of safe travel from Acquisitions Incorporated with slight modifications. Uh, mostly, instead of it, instead of the location being one to which you have traveled previously or for which you have an accurate map, it's and. So as long as the party has been to a place and has spent the money to get it mapped out, they essentially have a fast travel. They can. Um, they can perform a 45 minute ritual requiring 50 gold and consume material and can go from their, lo their current location to another location that they could normally reach within one day. So they will have to get like multiple, multiple locations mapped if they, if they want to do any significant fast travel. But basically this is a way to say, hey, if you are out exploring, uh, there are going to be some random encounters out in the, out in the world. Uh, I say random. I more than likely going to prepare them ahead of time. If you uh, if you do have a route mapped out, you can spend some money, or you can spend some materials, and we can just we can just get you get you around the continent. We don't have to we don't have to worry too much about it. Which makes sense. The the more that you travel the place, the more you get your bearings. The, the safer the routes are going to be. But with that, that's pretty much where we left off. Um, at, the, at the moment, I need to spend a lot of time just getting my bearings for how to really arrange the rest of the campaign. I, I've already pretty much migrated all the locations and quests that would normally be around 10 towns uh, and put them between the major settlements of Isocross. But there are a few like character focus background threads and characters that I need to figure out how to bring into the fold. I did stat out one of them as a mythic monster. And I am terrified of how that battle is going to go. Because I had a lot of fun making it. I know for Balaam Post for for Toph's background thing or I'm actually planning to pull something from Ghost of Salt Marsh in here oh, I'll, I'll need to talk to one of my players about it before I uh, fully bring it up in the in the appendix uh, besides the anthology of adventures they did add just a few like underwater maps and decide to make like a few different plug and play adventures that could take place using those maps. Uh, one of those, the Wreck of the Marshall, uh, is just this uh, shipwreck uh, where there, there's this adventure plot hook thing called Vecna's Twist. Uh, basically, the wreck would have been made by Vecna Cultists and during this festival, and there would be a army of undead coming out of the ship, the, the, sa the drowned sailors, that would come and attack. In this case, I think it would be the town of Saltmarsh. What I want to plug and play here is the fortress of Balen Post and the Cerberus Assembly Mages there have a Vecna cultist within there, a member of the Remnant. Wartor Alcarin, the head 
of Balen Post would have wanted to get one of the expositors from the Cobalt Soul to come and help root out this Vecna cultist. And so I think I want the players to like be able to have a little bit of an intrigue adventure going around the going around the fort being able to talk to the mages and figure out just like oh who who around here is actually a Vecna cultist. I would be able to I would be able to see a few of the other adventures there including one of the opening adventures the cold-blooded killer quest from rhyme of the frost maiden uh featuring some previously uh inserted pcs that have to do with a certain trade caravan and yeah whenever the characters finally uncover the cultists they'll, it'll be like oh <laughs> you you still won't be able to stop what i've put into into place and they'll need to go down to the ship and um yeah, figure out how to how to exercise the demons or the undead, which I think will be which will be I think will be really fun. It's still going to take them a while to get there, and I need to figure out which encounters I want to run before then. They'll also need to cross, you know, the giant river of lava before they can actually get to Balen Post. That'll take some time. It took them three days to get here, so I think it will take, like... Fifteen days... To really get across. Uh, I think, I think... Maybe a couple of, like, wild folk... Uh, encounters will probably... Will probably won't hurt the party be able to be able to just see more of the normal population of of Isocross. Besides that, um I just need to make sure that I can um I can make all the wonderful plot threads from Icewind Dale uh happen in a in a really believable manner. I I am removing the entirety of the um of the Dorgar Thing. it's like it's pointed out within the book that hey for um you can you can take these locations out of Icewind Dale and just like put them in other things specifically like you could take the Dorgar fortress and put them in the flock flock flocked it Alps of Wildmount that's like right right here around uh around Uthadurn It seems cool. Not something that I really want to do here. I, I really just want to focus on Isocross. I still am keeping the like threat of the looming winter happening. There is a plot thread connected to one of the islands that you may be able to to find out if you have the Explorer's Guide. I, w I want, to, want it to be a slightly less supernatural element um, because the mages of, of Aeor really do be doing some shit they they really stay doing some shit so i i, I think it would be really fun to just like keep exploring that angle in a very uh horizon zero dawn resonant evil sort of way and then of course there's the the big plot of hey we are looking for a big ancient city buried in the in the glacier not sure about glacier but there's a big buried city that's somewhat important here i think we can make that work there is also a a roaming boss encounter uh that's one of the bigger uh plot threads of rhyme of the frost maiden i want to do something similar but i think that's going to tie into one of the players backstories i think there's a lot to just throw out there a lot to just like have out in the world and it'll be really interesting to see whenever the players come across something how they how they deal with it what they want to interact with and what they don't i just got a lot of practice just letting plot threads grow and establish themselves out in the world without the player's intervention uh from my uh my urban shadows game on high shelf collective 
And I think it would be really fun to just let things continue spinning out of control if the players don't intervene. But all, all of those are just thoughts that I'm going to have over the next few weeks. I've got a dragon book coming out that's going <laughs> to, that I'm sure is going to make me want to put a lot of dragons in Isocross, more so than the ancient dragon that I threw at a level two party. Uh, and it'll just be, it'll just be fun to just like build it out, you know, and see what my players go after. But that's the game as it stands for right now. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, I think. Um, you know, November, December schedules always get funky. We'll, we'll see how it goes. And uh, yeah, I will see y'all next time. Bye.